Well, good morning, Walden Church. It's so good to see you this morning. Got a question for you. You can do it uh, from right where you're sitting, okay? So let's just, we'll just take a poll, all right? Uh, raise your hand if you think you are smarter than Socrates. Smarter than Socrates or wiser. You could say wiser. Wiser than Socrates, any? Nope, probably not. Okay, Socrates was a Greek philosopher from Athens. He's credited as the founder of Western philosophy and among the first moral philosophers of ethical tradition of thought. So yeah, a pretty smart guy. Anyone remember the Socratic method from school? The Socratic method, it's a way of having dialogue or conversations or presenting an argument. It's a way to speak between two individuals and it's based on asking questions and then kind of parroting back what you hear the other person say. I could give you a really quick uh, reminder. Okay, here's a, here's a quick tutorial of the Socratic method. First, you receive what the other person has to say. You know, you wanna hear their premise or their argument. And then second, you reflect back. So you sum up their statement and you repeat it back to them, okay? Then third, you ask them for their evidence. So what are the facts? They made a statement, it's a true statement. Ask them to support it with evidence. Maybe they have some, maybe they have none. Then you get them to restate their position. Maybe after thinking about uh, whether they had evidence or not, ask them to restate their position. And then you repeat it again. Now do they have a new view? Sum up their new statement. And then this becomes a cycle of conversation. <laughs> the cycle of conversation. It's, it's not about winning an argument in the Socratic method. It's not about listening to the other person talk and then thinking, well, this is how I'm gonna defend myself and I'm gonna win this argument. It's about finding an understanding between two people. It's about knowledge and truth and getting to the heart of an idea. Someone makes a statement, someone makes an observation, and then other people challenge that statement with questions. And then the person who made the statement is forced to defend it. Sooner or later, that uh, agreement is reached between the two people. And then both parties can say, yes, that statement is true, or that statement is false. That's the basics of the Socratic method. So if Socrates is one of the founders of Western philosophy, is his method still used here in the West? In other words, is this how we talk to one another? Is this how we share information? I, I don't think so, because I don't think we are talking to each other very much. I mean, we think we're talking to each other with texts and emails and over the phone and Facebook and Twitter. The, I, would, I would agree that yes, I think the world is much more talkative now than it's ever been, but I think the problem is that all of this talk comes at the expense of having a conversation. Meaning most of the time we are talking at each other, not with each other. Socrates would be disappointed. Because one of the great tragedies of our culture is that we have lost the ability to talk to one another reasonably. Social media has become an outlet to express feelings, but we don't talk to each other. You're upset about the day you had, so you post about it. You find out that your friend has cancer, and so you post a quote or a song lyric or a poem or a meme that relates to your feelings, but you don't actually talk to another person about how you feel. Venting online is not the same as talking to someone. And I think it's because we've lost this ability and the desire to have a conversation, that it's so much easier to hide behind a wall and just to lob opinions and to lob sound bites at one another. That's why we're seeing the chaos that's in the nation today. It's not about red states or blue states. It's not about liberals and conservatives. How do I know that? Because it didn't used to be this way. 
It didn't used to be this way. We have all forgotten how to talk to each other and how to listen and how to consider an opinion other than your own. Now, we've been looking at the book of Romans for a few weeks, and we've been comparing Paul to a lawyer in a courtroom. But I want to introduce to you a new word that perhaps might help you look at how Paul writes, how he presents his case. Paul is a Christian apologist, apologist, in that he is making a statement and then he's asking questions, the logical questions that would come from that statement, which is what a lawyer does in a courtroom. They, they take what is considered to be the fact and then they probe. They ask questions to either prove it or disprove it, depending on what side they represent. And that's what Paul is doing here in Romans chapter three. He is asking some very common questions, objections that are going around about Jesus, about Christianity, and he's gonna defend it. So what is a Christian apologist? Because it sounds like maybe it might be like evangelist, it's, uh, sort of. Apologist also sounds like apology, but <laughs> an apologist is not somebody who goes around and just apologizes for being a Christian. The term apologist means that you are able to give an answer to the questions and opponents to Christianity. In other words, an apologist can use any data, scripture, philosophy, history, even science, to defend the faith. The book of Romans is an apologetics book. Paul is answering the tough questions about faith. An, ev an evangelist shares their faith, but a an apologist defends it. And I would hope that we would all be people that could do both. Share the good news of Jesus and defend our faith for the people who ask those tough questions. So let's go back to Socrates for a moment, okay? We can, we can defend the faith, but as you're going to see here from Paul, he's not going to do it with sword and shield and lobbing grenades over a wall. He's going to do it with an actual conversation. Receive, reflect, refine, restate, repeat. So let's jump into Romans chapter 3. Paul writes, Then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? Much, in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though every one were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then, how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. What then? Are we Jews better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Sounds like a lot, <laughs> right? Sounds like a lot. But, it, but if you look at some key verses there, you can see him ask and answer the questions. Who's Paul writing to? Jewish Christians. In other words, converted Hebrews that all grew up with the Torah. They all grew up with the teachings of Moses. They grew up with the law. But then you also have Greeks. So Paul is using the Socratic method to defend his faith. Let's look at the verses that have question marks. Okay, look at his questions. His first question, is there an advantage to being a Jew? 
right? That's in verse 1. He says, yes, but only in the fact that it was their nation that was to bring the word of God. Verse 3, does our faithlessness cancel out God's faithfulness? And he says, no. God keeps his word even when the rest of the world doesn't. God tells the truth even when the rest of the world is lying. Verse 5, if we're all sinners and we were made this way, then why does God punish us? Paul says, well, that's like saying, let's do more evil so that God does more good. Because the darkness of my evil makes God's light look even brighter. And Paul says, that's a really dumb argument. <laughs> Verse 9, does that mean Jews are better than Gentiles? Answer, no, he says, we're all equally sinners. And then Paul says, remember, all means all. All means all. Every human being who's ever lived is a sinner. Paul says, all have turned aside. And then he starts quoting a bunch of Old Testament verses, mostly from Psalms, to prove it. He makes the statement and then he proves it with quotes. He says, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. Paul uses all those arguments to then set up his next statement in verse 19 and 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Now, verses 19 and 20, even though they're small, they contain some very powerful truth and some very important Christian apologetics. Namely, answering another question. The question, why do I have to read the Old Testament? Why do I have to obey the Old Testament, especially when we now have Jesus? What's the point? And the flip side of that is the Jewish argument. How can Christians follow the one true God? How can they follow Yahweh the God of the Old Testament, if they don't keep his law? How would you answer that question? Good news, you don't have to answer that question. Paul already did. Paul already did. His first question is, who is under the law? In other words, who is held accountable to the law? Is it only the Jewish people because they know the law? And Paul says, no, we are all under the law. He says, the whole world is held accountable. What does that mean? Well, it means we're all doomed. Why do I say that? Well, because there are 613 laws and most of us can't even name 20. Most of us probably only know 10. So what chance do I have of measuring up to the law? Zero, none, zilch. Paul says, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. In summary, it's impossible to be perfect. For something that is imperfect, us, created being, it's impossible for us to be perfect. So if we're all doomed, what can we do? What's the answer? Paul goes on. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Here is where we see the rubber hit the road. And this is what separates Christianity from every other man-made religion. Every other religion on earth is about works, 
and the sum criteria that you've got to hit, right, so that you are made right in the eyes of the God you worship. Romans and Greeks, they had a huge pantheon of gods. They had uh, 12 major gods, 12 big ones, and then about 40 or so little ones. And each one of those gods would have their own temple and their own way of worshiping. So you'd go into the temple, there'd be a little statue of that god, and then you would give that god food and money and flowers, hopefully in exchange for health and wellness, prosperity. Religion was a proper sacrifice done at the right way, done at the right time, done to the right God. And if you messed up, well, then there was a sacrifice or a payment that you would give to have your sins forgiven. And this is how human beings made up religion. This is why Romans 3.23 is the verse to memorize, because it is good apologetics for anyone, for any faith. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one can deny that. No amount of rules and no amount of worship or sacrifices can make you right. And when you read the entire passage, it says, for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Everyone is equally condemned and because we are unable to save ourselves, God gives us a gift. It's grace that saves you through Jesus. So Paul, what you're telling me is, I don't have to do anything? Nope, Paul says. It is received by faith. Only believe. Another way to think about this, if it's hard and confusing, is, if it is hard and confusing, right? You're listening to some faith or some religion, and it's a long list, or it's a long road, or it's works, or it's workbooks, then it's man-made. And if it's man-made, then it's worthless. Man-made religion can't save you. The truth is simple. And simple things are easy to recognize. Truth is easy to recognize. Sherlock Holmes said it best. Once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. Sacrifices of food and money and flowers to a clay statue cannot erase the sin that is in my heart. It can't make the darkness pass over. The cross of Christ has always been the answer for humanity. That's why Paul ends with this summary statement. He sums everything up for chapter 3 in verses 27 to 31. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one. Who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith? Do we then overthrow the law by his faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. And here is the answer to the question that we posed from the very beginning. Do Christians throw out the law? Do we throw out the Old Testament simply because we have Jesus? And Paul says no. He says we uphold the law. Look at what he says in verse 21. By now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. And so Paul says the law and the prophets, in other words, the Old Testament, right? bears witness to the righteousness of God, meaning it bears witness to Jesus. It tells us about Jesus. And at the end of the passage, he says, do we then overthrow the law by his, this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. He says that because he knows he doesn't want to lose his Jewish audience. He doesn't want to be accused 
of being against the law. So he makes a case that a person was justified without the law. But he comes back with a defense. And he says, salvation is from grace. It is through faith, but it does not belittle the law. But rather, it elevates the law, and it shows us the law's true importance. How? Well, grace provides the payment for the penalty of death. The law requires death for sin. And as we pointed out, none of us can be sinless. None of us can be perfect. None of us can keep the law. So something has to die. Second, grace fulfills the law's original purpose. The law's original purpose is to serve as a guide to show our complete inability to obey God and how high God's demands are. And that grace should drive us to Christ. And lastly, grace grants us the ability to obey the law. The law can have all of those different meanings. In this passage and the Gospels, it has meaning. If the law then refers to Moses, you want to say the law refers to Moses, then Paul's passage is referring to the way Jesus completed the laws of Moses. Jesus says himself, do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And if the law Paul refers to is the entire Old Testament, well, then the gospel fulfills the prophecies of the coming Messiah. The, the, those books tell about his coming. But let's say the law is the moral law. Well, then the gospel fulfills that too, because it is through Christ that people are empowered by the Holy Spirit to live in a way that pleases God. Paul knew there's going to be misunderstandings between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. That's why he makes this argument, and he uses good old Socrates to prove his point masterfully. Any worried Christians that were going to Paul and saying, does faith in Jesus wipe out Judaism? Does it cancel out our scriptures? Does it put an end to all of our customs? Does it declare that God is no longer working through us, his chosen people? And Paul says, no, absolutely not. In fact, when we understand salvation through faith, then we understand the Jewish story even better. A.W. Tozer said, nothing less than a whole Bible can make a whole Christian. Faith does not wipe out the Old Testament. Rather, it makes God's dealings with the Jewish people even more understandable. It is through faith that we understand why Abraham was chosen, why the law was given, why God works patiently with Israel for centuries. Through the entire Old Testament, God's foreshadowing his ultimate plan of redemption. Do you remember the story of Abraham and his son Isaac? Way back in Genesis 22, God told Abraham to take his one and only son and to sacrifice him. They're climbing up the hill together. Isaac looks around and he says, Dad, we have the wood, but we have no sacrifice. Where is the lamb? Where is the lamb? And Abraham said, God will provide a lamb. And sure enough, at that point, Abraham is ready to sacrifice his son. God steps in and provides a substitute sacrifice. In the next book, Exodus, God warns Pharaoh that the firstborn in Egypt would die because he refused to release Israel from slavery. God told every household in Israel to kill a perfect lamb, to smear its blood over the doors. And then the angel of death would pass over them. And then he came and he killed the firstborn in Egypt. The fruit of trusting, of having faith in God, led to freedom from bondage. And as they celebrate Passover, they remember the Exodus. God's intent was to show them that in that same way, they needed God to deliver them from bondage of sin by a perfect sacrifice of a perfect lamb, by the coming Messiah. 
If we had time this morning, we could walk through every Old Testament book and show you something in every one of those books that pointed to the Messiah. Samson was a judge who delivered Israel from the Philistines by sacrificing himself. Ruth was a foreigner to Israel who found redemption through a kinsman redeemer from the tribe of Judah. In Isaiah 53, God prophesied that there would one day be a suffering servant and God would lay on him the iniquity of us all and by his stripes we would be healed. You know, there's Christians that wonder why we even need the Old Testament anymore, when only the New Testament contains the gospel. But you know what? It's all the same story. It's all God's story. So it's all gospel. You know, I I take it back. I take it back. I said nobody could follow the 613 laws of scripture. Nobody could except for one man. And we all needed the law so that one day, we could recognize perfection when we saw it. We all needed the law so that we could recognize the firstborn when we saw him. We all needed the law so we could recognize our kinsman redeemer when he rescued us, healed us, fed us, restored us, and so that one day we would recognize the lamb that only the Father could provide. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the Old Testament and those stories because they are more than stories and they are more than history. This is your book and this is the way you have chosen to reveal yourself, your identity to your people. Thank you for these stories. Thank you for the story of the Messiah. We continue to pray for our Jewish brothers and sisters that they would see that the New Testament is also a Jewish book about a Jewish rabbi who came to die for the sins of his people, who came to die for all people, to be the last sacrifice, to be the step between us and God, whose blood would stand in the way of punishment and who would save and rescue and allow death and sin to pass over. It is the story. It is the greatest story ever told. It is your story. And may each Christian who hears these words and understands the book of Romans be able to go out and also explain these truths to others in a conversation, face to face, shared in grace, and truth, gentleness, and patience. We thank you. We thank you for this good news. Amen. Hey, well, thanks for coming out and uh, worshiping with us today. Of course, we would love to have you here. We'd love to have you here. Uh, We have two services every Sunday. Our first one is at 930. We have a traditional service. We have a choir. We sing hymns. We say the Lord's Prayer, we have communion, we do responsive readings. It's everything that you remember about church growing up. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service. We have a worship team. Come relaxed, come however you feel the most casual. And at that time, we also have a full children's program from birth all the way through high school. We would love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.